Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the December Fine Scale Live Build Show for YouTube Model Builders. Um, Tuesday, the 18th, 2018. Um, we've been a couple months. We're getting back to it. We're getting started on this big project that we've talked about a couple times. Um, we've got Ralph and Lloyd and, of course, Dave from Dave's, uh, Dave's Decals on with us as well. Um, he's done a bunch of Hydrocast kits. Um, a particular interest in this area. Uh, anyway, definitely should check out his YouTube channel and his webpage about the decals. They're pretty spectacular. Um, Ralph and I have both got uh, Delta Deco or HydroCal kits um, to work with. I don't think Lloyd got his in time, but we're going to work some live on camera and talk about this. This will be an ongoing project for a number of months. I expect it'll take three to four months to do a complete job on it. There's, um, there's a bit of time that it takes for things to cure and paint to dry. It's a slow process to work with some of these, some of these kits. And part of this is the extension of something we've been doing on this show all along, uh, where we started with some wood structures. We've done a couple of those back to back from, from a standard wood structure that we all did to, a, to some brick structures in wood. We worked with a little bit of resin on the last show, kind of as a preempt to this because resin and hydrocal, at least in my mind, are fairly similar to work with. You work with similar adhesives. And unlike styrene, which everybody has familiar with familiarity with, um, you don't use a solvent adhesive with it. N neither would you with wood because they're porous materials. So we'll get into some of those particular details. Um, you could use multiple types of adhesive. From I've seen people use wood glues and white glues with it. I, it's not really my preference. I don't think they're stout enough for it. Just like working with, with resin kits, um, I like epoxy. Um, it, it makes a good, strong, sturdy structure to work with. Um, if you're working with resin or, or, or something on a smaller uh, kit, such as uh, resin uh, fine scale rolling stock, for example, then then CA, super glue, um, uh, is, is adequate for that purpose. But I, I still prefer epoxy. Uh, with resin, the typical, the walls and such are, are typically quite a bit thinner. And I'll often uh, dilute uh, the epoxy to make something easier to work with. So you don't get a lot of it uh, squeezed out of the joint and out onto the surface of the material to degrade the detail on it. When I'm working with hydrocal kits, these things are quite bulky and quite thick. Um, and you'll get, you know, quarter inch thick walls. You've got quite a bit of material to work with. So straight five minute cheap run of the mill epoxy does the job as good as anything I can think of. And you end up with a, a solid structure. Uh, you do need to be somewhat delicate with the parts up until you get them assembled. I think they make a, a solid structure once they're well assembled, but it's not incredibly difficult and not uncommon to, to break components. Um, something that's that's spectacular about Downtown Deco is that you can reach back out to uh, to Downtown Deco and they'll, they'll get you a replacement wall for a particular section that you break. They also have some really neat uh, offerings available on the website or on their eBay store uh, quite often where they're off-selling uh, wall sections or straight brick sections uh, i've got some just straight brick sections from um straight brick section detail it's hard to cast the detail when it's in white uh this is a, a new england brownstone this is a, a dental plaster and it can be quite a bit thinner because of that and it's still quite solid uh and this was, I, I bought a bunch of pieces that were chips and breaks that gives you some brick wall material to work with. That's, that's pretty handy. Um, in my case, I've got a bit of a unique situation as, as I often do. Um, I bought like Appalachia and to, to anybody who's looked at pictures of Appalachia, it, it's hard to really grasp uh, the undulation that happens naturally in Appalachia. It, th there are not level spots in Appalachia or they're very exceedingly rare and quite small. Everything is quite hilly. And in any town section, you will rarely have a squared off section of town where the streets are, are on similar levels. They, they go up and down all over the place. So I've got to adjust for that with mine. But we'll talk about how to modify and, and augment these structures. Uh, tonight, I've got uh, a kit that I'm pretty happy, pretty happy with. I've got a few of these kits. Uh, also, there's a few others from... Uh, uh, I think of some of these brands off the top of my head, but there's a bunch of hydrocal kits that used to be available on the market um, up until say 10, 15, 20 years ago. There's a bunch of these and a few of them are still on the market, but downtown Deco is kind of the, kind of the staple of the hydrocal market these days. 
But if you get, if you go on eBay and look at some of these kits that are, that have been around a while, and we may, I may build one of those on a, on a future show or video it and show the video of, of building some of those. I've got a few of those kits. Some of those are really spectacular and they hold up really well over time. They, you know, the molding process hasn't necessarily improved that much because it hasn't, hasn't needed to. The detail that's on these is, is quite exceptional. This kit that, I, that I'm going to work with tonight has a, a few structures in it. It has two assemblies, uh, one that has the three structures and one that has a single. This is one of their limited run kits uh, that was available a year or two, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, again, I got it on eBay uh, available. I think, I think they made, yeah, they made 250 of these. Uh, they do make some limited run kits, but they have a pretty wide offering of small structures. Uh, also, if you're just starting with HydroCal, uh, Delta Deco has a $25 or $30 kit that's a, a little starter kit. It's a small, single-story structure, ideal to start with. Uh, Ralph's got that alley, the the uh, flat, uh, building flat. Right. It's got a the bunch of structures in it. The reason I got this is because uh, Randy put out a call for uh, weathered rail cars that he wanted to use in a photo shoot for the promo for the for the flat. I ended up getting chosen. So right right here is my boxcar. On the box. <laughs> on, that's, on awesome. the that's that's hard to beat, brother. That's as good as it gets. That's a good looking structure. How how long is that down the back wall? It's a pretty almost thirty inches. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty large kit. That's what I was recommending to Lloyd if, to, to consider putting along the back of this street scene that he's got now looking like the back of the uh, buildings for the next city street block over. When he sends his stuff out, he sends it out well packed. Absolutely. It's, he's got styrofoam in there to protect it. He also had the, uh, the double uh, wrap paper or white paper, whatever you call it, two layers of it, top and bottom. Pretty good. And on the off chance that Randy should send you something and you get a part that arrives broken, just give him a call and he'll replace it. No problem. Exactly. Yeah, he's a good fellow. We're looking to have him on a on a future show and, and talk about this production process and uh, you know what brought him into HydroCal, etc. And I've talked to him a few times. He's a he's a pretty superb fellow. Uh, Montana just doesn't have the greatest internet service, so we've got to work the work the details of that out for you guys. But we should have him on on a in a future show, possibly January. We're looking to have him on in January. But here's a kit that predates him. This is a uh, Thomas York. Oh, oh yeah. I've got a couple. I've got, I think I've got one of the York kits. That's one of those I was trying to remember. They're I've, spectacular. I've, I've built a couple of them. Well, I probably built about four or five of them, but this is the one that I'm working on right now. And you can see the, I don't know if you can see the stonework on the back is really, really nice on it. It's the, the only part of this is that is hydrocal is the stonework and the front porch on the bottom. And the rest of it is just all, uh, is all wood and stuff. But this is going to go to San Francisco. But I'm a fan. The biggest part about this is I, I'm not a believer that wood is the best way to do anything or hydrocal is the best way to do anything or wood is the best way to do anything. It's whatever what you're trying to replicate. If you're building a, a bridge, um, a steel bridge structure, but I think styrene is, is brass would probably be preferable, but it's so hard to work with. It's so time consuming to construct rivets and all that stuff in brass. Styrene spectacular for that. It's a great material for replicating steel. But for brick, and especially for stonework. So I've got a bunch of this uh, stonework from, from New England Brownstone that's in this dental plaster. And I, I bought packs of these that are just strips of stone so I can build up walls as I need to. And I'm going to use those on part of this structure, that I of this brick structure, to build up part of the back of it. And you can buy these packs of these strips of stone so you can build them up in various thicknesses and such. And I, I've built... Um, these are quite similar to what the Pennsylvania Railroad and uh, the Norfolk and Western Railroad uh, used for much of their retaining walls and structures. And you can use this stuff. The dental plaster and hydrocal are interchangeable, so they adhere to each other real well. But it's the right, whatever the right fit is. Uh, for example, in a couple of months, when we start working on the exterior detailing, I, I've got a, 
uh, a fire escape that I'm going to adapt to uh, headrails that's a wrought iron system. Brass is hard to beat for that, or etched stainless steel or etched brass. I can't imagine you could you could improve on on etched brass much better for that particular purpose. And if you're recreating wood, if it's siding or or ties under the track work, but the whole reason I had lay track is because I think wood ties look more like wood than plastic ties look like wood. So multimedia is the name of the game. Whatever is the right fit and the right combination of of Hydrocal, styrene, brass, wood, uh, and it fits everyone's paper. budget. I mean, if you if you you know if you've got uh, if you don't want to invest a lot of money in a building, styrene or something, it's going to be a little bit more economical for a person to to lay out a big city, especially if it's a background building that you're not going to be paying a lot of attention to. There's no sense in in, in putting a, a lot of money into something that's that is not going to be a focal point. Absolutely, right. and focus your 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 involved efforts, uh, both in labor and, and cost in what's on the foreground of the scene. For example, these hydrocal kits I'm working with go immediately against the fascia. They're extremely foreground. It must have interior details and, and, and all of that to adjust. Uh, and the, the, that wrought iron, uh, railing system and fire escape and ladder system will be one inch from the fascia at eye level. So it's critical that it's right, but for backdrop flats, um, I mean, paper and, and printed backdrop flats are pretty doggone good, or styrene is, yeah, it does the job. Here, Andy. Yes, sir. What's up, Lloyd? Hey, uh, so this is the building I'm getting. Uh, I'll just share it. Oh, yeah. I was looking at that one myself. I'll be getting it tomorrow. <laughs> And what I want to do is extend, added an extra section, which basically this is going to be a feed mill, an old field mill that's been abandoned. I'm fascinated with how Lloyd's talking about using that structure as the office for the <laughs> office building for an industrial complex. I just, I love that. And that's very, I mean, I'm sure that happens all over the country, but you see that a lot in Kentucky where some small business starts out in a rental house and they just, they continue to make money while while running an office out of that place, so it works for them. I, I'm I'm real fascinated when Lloyd gets that one in. Uh, I wish he'd got it ahead of tonight's show, but he'll get it tomorrow and see. I want to see how much work it would require to modify that into an inhabited structure so that it didn't look like a. So my my question then, Lloyd, is the section you want to extend. What material are you trying to represent? It's going to be all siding, uh, metal okay. siding that's been patched up, patched up, patched up. Okay. Okay. That explains it. Um, the reason I say that, and I, I'm just going to step back just a second because I don't think I had this done when we were on the other show. This, this was an old kit that was just a little warehouse type thing, trackside warehouse. And I cut it down and I added more to it. I have that boat launch area and I'm going to put another building behind it. But what I did is I covered it with, uh, with real wood. It's styrene, but I covered it with real wood. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's the entrance for where my, the, the boat ramp is going up into. And it, it does the trick for me. Absolutely. You get the benefit of ease of use or ease of work of so, putting something in styrene and laying wood over it. Well, multiple materials or like a combination you, of materials. Give you all an idea of this building here. This one's got to be shipped across the country. So I can't really build the wood inner, inner wall that you would normally build with this kit because it's going to be too fragile. And I've even made the roof where you can take the roof off in case you got to fix work on the lights or anything down the road. And it's it's on ABS, and I put the wood on top of ABS um, plastic, which I put just painted black on the inside, and uh, just got a little fake floor here that you can do. And you can just there's all the wiring and crap down in there for all the lights because this thing's got a ton of lights on it. And uh, then on this side here, you've got you've got the metal, and on the back side, and on the other side, it's all, it's all wood that I just laid on top of it. 
because you know it's it's got to be moved around a lot, and so it's going to have some rigidity to it. And I've even made this roof, and I've got it uh, double sided tape, but this one here actually will come off too, so you can get into this this section also if you need to. Uh, yeah. Using the uh, proper planning thing there, a little ounce yeah. of ounce of prevention. That's right. I don't have any structure that I can't get back into the interior of, but I'm putting lights in absolutely everything. And LEDs have a, a heck of a long life, but you don't want to destroy or have to tear a structure apart to replace well, one, but inevitably it goes out. It, I've shipped them LED, I've shipped them buildings before, and uh, the shippers have not always been so kind to them that I've ended up, you know, they break a light on the outside. And so they would, you'd have to get in there and try to fix the light after, after it was all sealed together. And that's a big pain. So I've started making it where you can take the roofs off or the bottoms off or something to get in there and fix the light if you need to. When if UPS or FedEx or whomever handle it. This one here, I actually think my sister flies back and forth to California all the time because she works up there. I'm going to have her hand carry it. I'm going to buy a seat for it. <laughs> wow. <That's smart. laughs> it's hard to ship that kind of stuff. They are. I, and honestly, if you did done a, a highly detailed job on any structure, this stuff doesn't survive UPS, FedEx uh, too well. Joe G, uh, uh, those uh, was asking about those stone blocks. That's uh, and they, the company I get them from makes uh, uh, abutments in various configurations and piers. It's it's New England brownstone. I think it's nebrownstone.com. I'm pretty sure it's nebrownstone.com, uh, um, and they do. Uh, just this dental plaster uh, stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty superb. I'm pretty happy with the detail. It, it replicates, it replicates that. And honestly, plaster in general replicates something that's hard to, that I've had a hard time trying to put the words to, to describe. It's a texture thing. I think wood does brick great. I think laser cut wood brick is, is superb. I mean, this stuff that, uh, Dick Basney's doing, imagine that laser art, um, and the stuff that uh, Monster Model Works was doing before before their demise recently, which I'm upset about their demise. But um, that that laser cut brick is spectacular. But the, it I don't think it's that laser cut wood replicates every surface as well as it does brick. It does a pretty good job with brick. But the stone and concrete and various this is harder to see because I've got some rubber bands around it now. But um, the this structure has uh, has um, Let's see. It's got stucco on, on. I mean, it's multiple surfaces, so it's got stucco on one wall with the brick exposed. That the detail is superb, but it rep, represents and replicates uh, all the cornice work and this this uh, uh, random square cut random stone that's on the out on the outside edges. This has a this model had a bit of a chip out of it, but I have the chip. And when I started here, put this together with epoxy in a minute under camera, I, I'm going to stick that piece back in. I knew that when I bought it, but you know, since they only, since Delta Deco only sold 250 of these, I'd had a, a a running search on eBay for a little while for this particular kit, and what popped up. So, because it's really close to the prototype pictures, because I'm trying to match. Yeah, I'm cheating. I'm not, you know, in my case, I am modeling a prototype. I'm not scratch building absolutely everything. When I started my layout, I initially thought I would scratch build literally every structure to photos. Um, that's not humanly possible or, or not yet. So until somebody figures out this immortality thing, some compromises in the name of creating a, you know, a finishing or, or getting a layout to a reasonable state, some compromise is required. But I think it does a good job for that. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that. That's, yeah, that's the ticket. Eddie Brownstone. I thought it was Eddie Brownstone.com. I really like their stuff. And I talked to those guys too when I was ordering some stuff. There's another one, Crow River. I think is the Sissy company that Crow. makes. Yeah, yep. that's right, Sissy Crow, and they're wrapped up with the same guys that I buy the the metal roofing and corrugated metal and racing uh, roofing um, now. So it's all, all correlated. They do a lot of hydrocal stuff. That's that's pretty. They have a roundhouse. Sissy Crow's got a roundhouse that's about as good as anything I've ever seen uh, in any medium. For any structure style of anything, it's what it's my favorite single structure that a kit manufacturer has ever produced. So and while we talk, I'm going to point my camera down. Um, There's railroad kits; they also do hydrocal. Um, CC Crow, Thomas Short, Downtown Deco. There's a few others. Are our kits? They do. That's the. Uh, 
I think his name in just a second. It's it's tip of our tongue. But. Ed Ed Fillets. They they took over Ed Fillets kits. That yes, and I didn't know they were doing hydric. I thought I thought they had. Some, I knew they had some resin stuff and styrene and various things. They're doing a lot of mixed medium stuff, like Bar Mills is though, right? I mean, it's a flex. It's a bunch of different mediums. Um, uh, railroad kits? Any no. the New England brownstone? No, I think it, the best I remember it was primarily HO scale, but uh, not to mention New England brownstone just does a very small uh, selection of a few parts. They haven't been around terribly long, a few years, and uh, I, I reached out to him and talked to him about it because I needed some some uh, piers built to Norfolk Western style, which are uh, slightly different. Uh, they have the water cut away only on one side, on the upstream side, and and he's gonna he's gonna make them for me. I, I have to you know get all these plans together and everything for it, which is mainly the reason I've I've been thinking I'll just cast. You know, just cast my own, create a master and cast my own in plaster. It's another benefit to plaster. It, it's easy to patch, easy to fix, easy to work, relatively easy to work with, and pretty easy to cast your own parts. So if you wanted to make something in HydroCal, it wouldn't be that hard to take a styrene structure and make a mold, pour some plaster in. Um, I mean, plaster rocks have been, a, you know, plaster rock molding has been a staple in the hobby since it began, pretty much, I, I'd imagine. Now, Randy on his on his wall, some especially some of his older kids. I don't know if he's doing it so much nowadays, but he used to lay each one of the bricks one by one. If you get some wow. of the other kids, you'll see them that they've been done one by one in styrene, and then he makes the master out of it, and that was gives it so much dimension. I I could see that th there is a distinction to this that I haven't seen, and and, and don't get me wrong, Nick Masty or, or uh, imagine that laser art and and Monster Model Works to, to similar degree did some really spectacular things with the laser. I mean, just really, really good brickwork modeling, but it's still pretty uniform. And the degree of real world variability that's in these plaster kits uh, and, and the Thomas York stuff. Uh, I mean, I haven't built that that yet, but I've just opened a box up and looked at the parts. It's it's superb. I've got the interest, Yorks. The interesting part of those wood kits, though, yes, the brick is uniform, but it's up to you to change it. You can take your exacto and pop off the face of a brick or a bunch yep. and make it look like it's decaying. Yep. And and it's all in the painting and, and the way you finish the surface. Absolutely. And it's so easy to take the base a, to go with. I, and I'm a big fan of that. I mean, the vast majority of of, wood, uh, of brick structures on my layout will will be imagine that laser art structures. Uh, they're just they're absolutely superb. Um, it, it's just there's a different a mix of different materials. Another thing, the era, era matters for this stuff. We've talked about this on various regular chats we've had with people talking about these buildings not being appropriate for a modern era layout, which is strictly not true by looking at photos of the real world. I mean, there's buildings in the real world, in downtown where I live, there's buildings that have been there a hundred years, more than a hundred years in fairly rough shape. I think uh, downtown Deco, especially the pictures that they show uh, on his website, a lot of those are highly tailored to the late seventies, early eighties kind of run down um, <coughs> Kind of theme. I mean, he is, you know, the the branding he has on the products really well tailor it to that very popular these days, seventies and eighties, early nineties era of modeling. They're just as relevant if you were modeling two thousand eighteen. Uh, in my case, I'm modeling nineteen fifty, so I don't want them to be as degraded or as diminished. But that's all in how that's that's paint. That, well, that's detail. It's it's exactly that. It's detail. You can take an old kit. Uh, like uh, Brian on our regular chat, he took that old warehouse kit and he played around with the window framing, the mullions, and made it look more modern. Yeah, I really and, liked the effects of that. I wasn't sure when he was initially describing his idea about that. I, I, neither was I. I couldn't imagine. Okay, I, I'm, I'm glad you. I don't think you. I don't know if you said that at the time, but I, in my mind, I was. I was. I wasn't sure if I was confident whether that would work out. So I was amazed at how well it's, it's a good effect. It's a convincing effect. 
and and the the interesting part of the whole hobby is you try and rep usually it's replicating anywhere from the 50s to the 80s or early 90s that's pretty well uh the the the, the gambit that everybody's doing at some point and yeah. it doesn't matter whether the building is from the 50s it's still relevant in the 80s if you go into the back alleys of all of these places you see exactly what you get in these kits and it's just a matter of, and the details are what define it we were talking about this with uh with wall signage uh like the uh, wall signage and billboards and that kind of stuff those things set the set the time as much as anything i mean if you have a nice bright looks like it's only been up a couple years uh poster like i've got a few of those uh yeah that's spectacular i mean that just looks I like, like that. that's got the 80s wrote all over it man um like quite literally wrote all over it but uh, if you have the buy war bonds or, you know, the, the Uncle Sam needs you posters, I've got a few of those that I printed out because it, it's just very accurate for a 1950 scene. Those would still be around. Or if Chesterfield cigarettes or some of those brands, they really set the scene very much so. Uh, I mean, it's amazing how much branding does. This is, what I've been, but, just, this is what I just haven't really had time to finish up. I've been playing with it. It's a burnt out building. You can see it's burnt out. It's got a tarp on the roof there where it's uh, nice. Nice. We're, we're, we've got the hole in it and stuff and the little, the little cones. I don't know if you can see those or not. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. The cones to keep people away. Then I did the graffiti on the side. It, it actually just says Dave's decals. It's sort of like a promo piece. And, um, you know, and it's got the older stuff on the top and lights and things. And, the, and then I just get those little tiny, I don't know if you see these little tiny stars, I, I get those things at like uh, Hobby Lobby. They're like sequins, little star sequins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The wall reinforcing uh, uh, plates. The yeah, yeah, the tie backs. Little, little plastic stars that you can you can buy through, you know, yeah. Hobby Lobby. Buy a bag of a billion of them for like a dollar. Do you put a do you put a nut bolt washer casting or an NBW casting through the center of it, or just put the star on it? I just stick a star on it. I mean, who's going to look that close? Got Andy will. Yeah, <laughs> I, I knew somebody was going to nail nail Dave, me for that. They've already got Dave, a hole in the middle of them from for because they're a sequin. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of them's already got holes in the middle of them, but these things are tiny. I mean, they're like they're like two millimeters, so they're about the right scale for a building. Because I've got the real stars, you know that I, that I've I've used to do demo on buildings and stuff when I was younger, and I and we used to. I'd snag those those old cast iron stars. I mean, some of them are like this big. Some of them are you know, yeah. six, six, six inches to a foot in size, all the way down to three inches. Yeah, they're going to vary. And, and it's all about where it is on the layout, whether it, whether it has the detail or not. I put NBW or nut bolt washer casting, so stuff that's immediately adjacent, like the water towers I built. I've got NBWs on every single connecting um, tie on the uh, – on the uprights, on all that trestling for holding the water tower up, because it's immediately at the foreground. I wouldn't do that if it was two or three feet away. I do subscribe to the three foot rule if you're three feet away. I remember, I think you've seen mine. I've made my own with uh, styrene. They're yep. so tiny. <laughs> we talked about that. Uh, there's there's one I just been, just been fooling fooling with. Get the graffiti around the top and vines growing up the bottom. Going up the bottom. Band. You've been busy. Yeah, that's buddy. the that's the Titchy kit. No, no, this one is a Corber. Oh yeah, okay, that's right. I've seen that. Cor Corber's good stuff too. Actually, Corber has a roundhouse. Speaking of roundhouse, they have a roundhouse, but it's uh, it's styrene, but it's it's hey, a pretty. It's like fifteen bucks, you know. That I, I like Corber stuff. Actually, Corber stuff's really heavy, well built. I mean, the Corber walls for the Corber structures are they're stout. That's a stout stout structure. I put this one together and I was just like, what am I going to do with it? So I said, well, I was going to make it an abandoned one with the, originally I thought about doing one like for the 70s show with the pot leaf and all that crap on it, but only, I didn't have anything going all the way around it, you know, from well, that. Put, put the pot leaf on it and send it up here to Canada. Yeah. You, you know, the, you know <laughs> that, that show, the 70s show. Yeah. 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 And they got, they always go to the water tower and they got the big marijuana leaf painted on it and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna do one like that, but I was like, "Well, I only, that's the only thing I know that's on it." You know, I don't know anything else, so it's kind of boring. And so I'm like, "Well, I'll just do graffiti all the way around it, and put some signs to keep off, throw some vines growing up the legs, and throw it up there and see what happens." 
All right, my best of my workbench. By the also, this is the trick. Let's get a little bit better camera view. This is the best trick. I okay, a couple tricks when it comes to building maybe any structures at all. Period. However, the only thing that I'd have to say about hydro cow is it's not at all forgiving uh, for the square assembly part of construction. Uh, styrene, you can bend and flex. Uh, this stuff does not bend at all. It quite literally shatters. So you get it right. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It just does. And even re resin warps. The only, the biggest problem with resin, like those old Magnuson kits. I'm a, I love the old Magnuson kits. I actually think they were better than the styrene that, uh, that, uh, whatever, whatever's being done. The, the. Would the Cedix or uh, or Walters, whoever bought Magnus, and I can't remember right this second, but I, I like the resin Magnus and kids better than I like the styrene ones. But DPW bought them, and okay. then, then Woodland Scenics bought them. Okay, Woodland Scenics has got most of their stuff now, don't they? That's yeah. right. I knew it was Woody's or, or Walters, I just couldn't remember. Magnus is well, it's a the same guy uh started Magnus first and then he sold it. I think I was thinking uh, Walthers, but I can't. I couldn't remember. I went yeah, to, it, went it, to DP, went to DPW first. And DPM, and then, and then DPM the same DPM guy. Uh, yeah, I knew what you meant. Take me for what I mean. Don't want to say I knew what you meant. Um, so the same guy started Madison, and then and he sold it. Then he started DPM. Then he sold it. Now he started the the company he has now. That's actually his name. What? Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and, he, and and it's not so, that company's not sold yet, but he keeps selling his companies. But one of the best tricks. I, so first, working on a sheet of glass is well, I, I I won't say any of this is required. You build it however works for you, whatever works. I wouldn't do it without a sheet of glass personally. That's 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 my personal preference. And this is one of the best tricks I I had ever seen when I first got back at the hobby a few years ago. I wish I'd known about gluing a piece of sandpaper to a board two decades ago when I was in the hobby before, but um, so a piece of sandpaper. So this way you, and I, I'm cheap skater. This is lots of two before I cut because I, I have both, uh, I have a combination of too distracted to remember to, and maybe too cheap to pay the prices I've seen for those, um, those one, two, three blocks. I'm not paying 25 bucks a block. I'm just, where are you shopping at, man? I can get you stuff for seven dollars. Okay. I, well, all right. We'll have that conversation here in a minute after the show's <laughs> over. Because I, I've been wanting some for a while, and and I have seen a few good deals. But like I said, it's a combination of getting distracted and getting busy. And when I sit in front of the workbench to do something, I'm like, yeah, I really need to get some of those one, two, three blocks. And then when it comes time to get on eBay and do any shopping, I don't do it. So, but I've done it a bunch with these. I cut a bunch of these square on a on a miter saw to to give me something square to work with. And I've already done a, the base structure on these or the base squaring on these. So they were, you know, but you just need to keep, keep it somewhat square. And I'd imagine you could probably roughly get it square and probably sand it adequately. Just hold it, you know, somewhat correctly and make the movements, but it's a lot easier than taking a sanding block or a, I like these things um, super well, but for me, it works pretty good to just have something that holds it square. So you make nice square edges. Also, exactly like a DPM structure, you'll have a front facing wall and the rear the rear or the side walls will set behind that. So the, the facade of the building is uh, is standing proud of these walls. So you need and and you'll have two side walls. On these two side walls, depending on what could material they are, this one is stucco in my case, this one is brick. On this brick wall, you'll have one side that has that has brick detail on it. Same thing as you'll have on a downtown deco, or, a, or I'm, I'm sorry, on a downtown deco, on a, uh, a Walther structure or a DPM structure or whatever. You, you'll have the same situation where you'll have that detail. So make sure you just don't sand that brick detail off. The key to getting these things to, to shape up right. And the, the key in a, a, a well-built one and, and otherwise is getting that seam getting that seam as tight as reasonably possible. Now I have this same approach to every structure I work with. I, you could, a lot of people paint their walls. I've seen people build up each individual wall. They'll tape off the side that makes it a, a joining. Cause when you make these, the joints, you're going to want, this is a porous material, which has 
trade-offs, you know, it has positives and pitfalls. Um, it, it, it's great for getting the texture and detail we want on it. You absolutely have to prime this stuff with a good primer um, of some color. I, I, I'll probably use gray uh, in my case because I want a fairly bright red. On a lot of times when I'm doing brick, I put a uh, brown on it to warm up my base tone where I'm going to put red over top of it. But you get a nice, a nice tight seam. There's a few ways to straighten that seam up. Uh, I've seen some guys on YouTube, actually. I've watched some guys who took the, uh, made, used plaster to do it or took the same, the dust off from this kit. So you're using the exact same plaster and, and mix that up. Um, I think they just used water, but I probably would have put a dilute glue in it. Um, uh, and mix that up to make a paste to fill this in with. Um, I've done several hydrocals before and the little bit of seaming that I've ever had to do, I just use spackle, regular run of the bell spackle. Um, that seems to, so for me, it held in the gap pretty good, but I've never filled up very large gaps. All I'm trying, all you've got to do is fill that slight seam there. Um, for that matter, I would imagine you could probably use a standard squadron putty or something. I, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't. You guys, do, you guys used one of the putties before on, on HydroCal? Does it stick used, to it? Uh, sculpting paste. I've used regular uh, lightweight spackle. I've mixed up HydroCal. Uh, normally, I just sand them till they till they're flush. But oh know, yeah, but you're gonna but you're gonna get gaps sometimes. It's inevitable. Uh, but yeah, I've used I've used paste and stuff like that. But predominantly, I use a sculpting paste. Sculpting paste. I've used the sanding powder you get from what you're doing right now. Okay, you're the one who was talking about using this original powder, and I thought about yep. that some, and I was thinking, well, what would make that stick? Would make that reactivate correctly? I was like, well, I could put a, a dilute, a little bit of glue in it to, to ensure that it was. And I've already the thing is, the thing is you, you're not filling a large gap with it. You're filling a small gap. And Absolutely. You don't need a lot of adhesive at all. I, I do it with alcohol, so that it dries quickly. You also have to make sure that the the hydrocal is wet when you do it. Otherwise, the the hydrocal panels draw the moisture out of what you're trying to fill too quickly. Oh yeah, of course. And well, and just like, I mean, it, good advice to anybody doing anything with, with plaster of any kind, whether you're working on uh, base scenery for your structure or putting rock molds on or whatever, the only way to work with plaster, if you're adjoining plaster to existing plaster, your existing plaster must be wet. Otherwise it's going to leach that moisture out of it near immediately. And it's going to cause whatever setting up, to not have moisture long enough to set up correctly. And one of the th one of the things that I've done when I've done my rock work and so on, I'll fit all my, I'll fit dry fit all my pieces that I want to put together, and then when I go to glue them in place, I put them all in a bucket of water. Water is not going to dissolve those things. No, all it's going to do is so soak up the water, so that when you put your glue on it doesn't get sapped of all its liquid that's in it. It tends to bond better with the surface. Yeah, that's a good way to do that. I haven't thrown them in a bucket. I normally just keep a spray bottle of water around, hold my, hold my casting, my rock casting when I'm doing rock work, hold it out over the aisle or something and spray it pretty good. No, bucket of water. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to do that. I think it honestly it gets a pretty doggone tight seam anyway. What's they're saying relatively flush. I think these are. Another consideration is is the there will be, like on any other structure, you'd have the same problem on a styrene structure. You're gonna have some casting uh casting work to clean up. Um you know, you'll have a little bit of flashing or whatever yep. you'd call that hanging out into the windows. Um I I did most of it with an exacto. I just, you know. Lay it in there, and I don't cut at it for risk of jagging, jabbing into it. Do that. I just gotta drag it across. Paper but, nail flow, yeah. cardboard yeah, nail flow. Yeah, these I like that better, and, and I've got some, and I, I like that a lot better than using a. Uh, uh, I started out using a a file. Yeah, a regular file. They just get so dirty so quick; they're hard to deal with. And these little disposable ones, these are some of my favorite ones I got. These little bitty narrow suckers. They will fit long, it. otherwise it burns right through. I, I you use Ralph. I go down to the uh, Dollar Tree and I buy those uh, nail files for a, two for a buck, two three yep. for. A buck. 
Yeah, I buy those all the time. The, that's what these black ones are. And I'm a big fan of these. And uh, I, I would never call it a sanding, or I never call it a nail file. I always forget to. And I tell Angie when she's going out after something sometimes, bring me back some sanding sticks, and she laughs at me uh, over it. But, but a little bit of filing, you know, filing or a little bit of sanding works just fine. These Some of these windows are quite small, so it's hard to get all the, you know, but you're going to have to get it fairly clean for the windows to set correctly, especially in my case, because I'm going to use the real glass, uh, real glass window slides. At least I'm pretty sure I am. I'm a little bit concerned about, because they need to fit, they need to set back into these windows. It's not like a, a very thin walled um, plastic That's, kit where they set on the back, but. As you're sanding those openings, you should have that window there handy so that you can keep test fitting it. And when you finally get it this, the size and shape you want, um, you don't have to go any further. I use canopy glue to hold it in place. Oh, Again, yes, I, wet the, I wet the plaster before I put the canopy glue on. Oh, I'm an absolute believer. I, I even brought it out here for working on this. I'm an absolute believer. When you're working with, with glass, there's nothing else I use around glass windows but canopy glue. And well, I there is told, one other item. There is one other item, if, actually two if you can get it. Um, one of them is weld bond. And I forget the name of the other one now. Shit. Just regular weld bond white glue? Yeah. It okay. dries crystal clear. Um, why don't Elbers dry clear? What's I mean, well bought and Elbers the same thing, just two different manufacturers. But Elbers absolutely does not. No, Elmer's there's something in it. Yep. I use the lanes, but a lot of times I'm making my windows. Uh, I'll I'll put it over top of the windows and let it dry, so they look like they're old wavy windows. Yep, I really like that effect when it's called for, and it depend like everything else, like we were talking about with background structures. It totally depends where on the layout the structure is going, how I'm going to treat the building, what I'm going to use for a building, whether it gets interior or not, and especially windows. So if it's on the foreground, I have a complete convert to the Sierra scale models. Uh, they're basically uh, microscope cover slides. They're actually thinner than microscope cover slides, but they're there, real glass. There you go. Tight bond. Yep. Yep. We can get that. We can get tight bond around here. Yeah. Yeah. It's all and, a lot. This this is translucent wood glue, huh. and I also have the other one, which is uh, no run, no drip, and it's meant for uh, uh, molding, molding and trim. Huh. Again, it dries dries clear. I know they had all those different choices of wood glue. I I get that. I have been a I'm a pretty big fan of the. Uh, that wood glue I use, uh, Gorilla. Gr it's not Gorilla polyurethane glue, but Gorilla brand yep. wood glue is much better than Albers for dog on sure. It's 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 got some body to it, and it it works better for me. So what you say did it got uh, got the quarters relatively. Correct. I've still I've got some work on my windows in my case. We'll figure that out in a in an upcoming show when we talk about some of that. I'm looking at the chat here. Martin Martin Rabbi says uh, my daughter bought me a bunch of those things, those files from Sally Beauty Supply. Like Dave said, it's cheaper if you go to the dollar store. You get about yeah. ten of them, ten of them for a buck. Yeah, these style. This the style at the dollar store, right? The, and I like these better in a lot of cases. Depends on what I'm doing. And then I like these. You get like two of the, you, know, you get two of these in a pack for a buck or whatever. Um, these come from a from a hobby supply house somewhere. When I was ordering micro or maybe eBay, when I was ordering micro brushes, um, and I liked them well enough that I've ordered more of them because they're narrow. They fit into little spots where this wouldn't fit. Of course, you could always throw this on. You know, throw this down, throw a ruler on it, and chop it in half with a, you know, with a utility knife too. That would do the job. So, but it's easy. and a file would do the job great too. The problem with the files, you got to clean the file up after the fact. So you yeah, but that's easy to do. You use a toothbrush. Yep. 
Yeah, that's just a, good a regular thing. old toothbrush. Just brush your your sanding stick, and it it takes the plaster out of it. Well, Butter. that's what I do with the sandpaper too. Uh, but I'll, and another thing, the sandpaper that I've got glued to the board is uh, the first that I did. I wore it out, but the first I did, I used regular sandpaper. Now I use wet dry sandpaper, so it could take, so I could get it the sandpaper wet uh, to wash the powder out of it. Interesting. Yeah, it worked. Made it a little bit easier. The ones I buy are hot pink. Makes them easy to find on a workbench. Exactly. Well, yeah, that works in a, in a lot of cases. So around, around the office with all the other IT guys I've got, if I buy a tool and I want to make sure nobody's going to steal it, I'll put hot pink electrical tape on it. I've got some hot pink. Actually, I think it's duct tape, but I've got some hot pink tape I'll put on whatever I've got around the office. Nobody will steal it. But here at the house, if I put pink anywhere close to it, my wife stole it already. So can't be pink or it won't last. <laughs> so adhesives, regular, cheap, five-minute epoxy stuff. Um, I've ordered a bunch of epoxy. off. The, I've ordered epoxy for a while off the internet. I've went to just buy whatever Lowe's carries at the time because it's easier to get a hold of. So five-minute epoxy. Like when I did epoxy before, I keep the hotel cards that you're supposed to turn back in. Uh, supposed to or whatever, but they ask you to turn it back in, but they're great for epoxy. So until they quit becoming, until they quit being great for epoxy, they're not getting them back. So Every once oh, when I, true value or, or my uh, tractor supply, they'll have a gorilla epoxy, two part epoxy on clearance. And I don't know why it's on clearance because they still carry it, but I'll just buy them all. They'll be like two bucks for one of those little syringe jobs. It's got the two on either side. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've always liked buying them in the bottles and mixing them myself, but I don't know why. I mean, I'm still putting it in equal parts. It's probably just making my life harder doing it that way. I just, for some reason, I've always preferred the larger, you know, the regular bottles. I mean, well, if I can get them for like a buck or two bucks on clearance, I'll just buy them all. I don't care. Oh, yeah. Well, I do buy those little stupid disposable kind of wood shot super glues. I mean, I use, you know, model super glues and I use, uh, you know, various brands of super glue. But super glue has such a, a short shelf life, you know. But you only got six, six or eight bucks on a super glue. So there's a I'll trick to keeping it. There's a trick to keeping it. Putting put it put in it. a Ziploc bag. Put it in the fridge. Put in the fridge. Yeah. Right. Ziploc bag and put it in the fridge. All right. I, I'm all over that. I did not know that would make a difference. I would have thought it dehydrated it. You get another two, three months out of it. Well, all right. Yeah, I'm all over that because I I, I kill super glue. I'm using. Well, I, the vast I I rarely get more than halfway through a bottle of super glue. Sometimes I get in a big project like here lately. I got into laying a bunch more track, and that burns through super glue fiercely because I glue the tie plates on it. I burn through super glue pretty fiercely when I do it. But other than those few occasions when I get into some big project, I just about always throw a half a bottle of super glue away. And Are you? You talked about filling cracks earlier, and I've, I've seen the technique around for a long time, and I've never really in, in used it. It's super glue and baking soda. Yeah. Baking Bacon uh, soda. I've done that before. Uh, I think it was in physics class or, or whatever in high school, but I got caught, and they wouldn't let my bridge compete. So, uh, you know, you build those bridges that are supposed to hold some amount of weight, but you're not allowed to use baking soda and i thought i was being slick but um i will yeah you were being slick all right no i was being yeah would you could probably you, you probably use that trick to fill gaps if you wanted to yep yep that works like a champ and actually um well and, and what a lot of the the difference in a lot of these paints is is talcum powder um so, I mean, you can add talcum powder to paint to thicken it up, kind of like adding uh, uh, cord, uh, whatever that cord stuff is. You add it, making, you know, in, in the cook, in cooking, cord starts. That's right. In, in cooking processes, uh, cord starts will thicken it up. Well, talcum powder has a similar effect to, uh, well, to acrylic paints anyway. And a lot of paints you buy, for example, um, paints like, uh, uh, chalkboard paints or very, very, very flat 
paints are just about always just paint with a bunch of talcum powder added to it. So, and you don't want this stuff to squeeze out. So I put the epoxy along the back side. Uh, I also generally would use on every structure, even wood structures, plastic structures, whatever. I about always use uh, either styrene or, in the case of wood or or hydrocal, put a little stick of wood behind the the quarter. In this case, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that because the windows are fairly close to the quarters. So if I can fit it, I will I will put a, a quarter brace in. But I'm not sure I can. Uh, and you surely want everything to be squared level. That's why the glass works so well. You can't get a, a surface level as you can with a, you know, as a piece of glass is going to be for you. Well... There <laughs> is that a safety glass, like a like a tapered glass? Is that? Yeah. I think that's what this is tapered. If you can get it, it's a little expensive, but if you've got a piece from a, an old coffee table or something, uh, I find that a uh, three quarter inch piece of uh, MDF works as well. Yeah, because it's okay. You, really you, like you can actually, you can actually. You can actually no no not plywood, right? Unlike Ply, plywood, MDF is pretty strong. Not not all plywoods are are fully smooth on the on the no, surface. No. Uh, MDF you can actually use it as a fine sandpaper as well. Huh? If you go to auctions or thrift stores, you can buy like those big pieces of glass like they used to put on desk occasionally, yep. pretty cheap. That's what I've got on my my drafting table, a big one. I think I paid a dollar for it. Wow! And what is quarter inch thick glass? It's Almost yeah, it's quarter, quarter inch. inch. It's heavy as snot. And glass is often quite doggone expensive. So it's got the beveled edges on it, so it's nice and smooth. It was it's it's probably about uh, three by four. I'm sold on working on a piece of glass. I mean, there's a bunch of advantages to it. I mean, you could throw instructions or a template that you're using under it so you could cut wood, chop wood right on top of it. You could chop and cut with a straight X-Acto or a straight razor blade, just chop straight into it. So cut the little detail parts like tie plates and stuff. There's nothing better than chopping them on glass. There's nothing works anywhere as close. And if you're doing something like painting or something like that, you could just pour a little paint out, a little dot of paint out on the glass and work. Yeah, I use it for a mixing board, and I just scrape it off with a razor blade when I'm done. Yeah, man. Yep, you can be you can be incredibly lazy with it. I originally started out, and I do for certain things, um, buy these little things, but I I don't use them much anymore. I use them when I'm mixing weathering powders with alcohol or something, but otherwise I don't. And that's why I leave the that's why I leave it leave it in there because then I can just go put a dot of alcohol back on top of that. It's back soft again. I only use those okay. pans if I'm using something that's really really watery. If I've got it really watered down. Yep. Yep. If I'm using a wash or if I'm making something that has uh, that is starting with powders and adding liquid to it, then I got to mix it. But otherwise, I just pour it out on the glass. So let's, tell us about that structure, that backdrop flat, because I may very well be, I may that may very well scratch the itch I've got in my CD seat as well. That that may be a good one to buy for the backdrop. So it's a bunch of buildings just like this structure I'm working on, put together yep. across that thirty inches or so. Yep. And it obviously comes in a few pieces since you're working with an eight or nine inch piece there. One, two, three, four, five pieces. And you get uh, a bag of plaster cast parts as well, like boxes, shipping, you know, all different or, uh, stuff on the freight, on the loading docks. Yeah, actually, he um, has a, a package of uh, boxes and crates and stuff yeah. like that that's 20 or 25 bucks. It looks like it's a lot of parts well, for 20 bucks. The last few times that he's had a sale, I've tried, I've tried to post it on YouTube Model Builders so that everybody gets the opportunity. Um and his sale was pretty good. You buy buy one, you get one, or buy two, you get one. Uh, yep. So this thing has. Why won't this close now? There we go. 
Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven buildings, basically. Wow, that's that's spectacular. Yeah. That's, one, that's one that he doesn't have Dave decals in yet. I'm going to have to talk to him about that. Is that right? Is he packaging your decals in some of them? Yeah, several of his kits have got my decals in it, and a couple of kits have got models I built on the cover. Right. Like Cooters. How about well, that? Well, I got there before you on this one <laughs> with my boxcar. I just want to, I want decals on the building. Andy was talking about all these um, uh, signs and so on on the buildings uh, earlier. And the same signs that you had on the buildings in the 50s or 60s, you may still see or just barely see in the 80s and 90s. Ghost like the war bonds. Real ghost signs, exactly. That's those are the signs that I really like is the ghost signs. I got if you if you if you're ever on my site, if you go to the one thousand series, that's where all the ghost signs are at. I've got probably about 40, 50 sets of ghost signs there. If you get them on clear and then like do a, a light wash underneath of them with a say a light gray or, or an antique white or something like that, and then put the clear on top of it, you're gonna give it that faded look. I, there's nothing better. There's nothing sets the the era better than those kind of details. I I think signage is is so, so typical. And I, I mean, if you have to use tagging and graffiti, you may. Have. Andy and I did these signs. He did it on online, like on the show, while I was telling him how to do it, and it worked out well. And these these signs are are printed on a regular inkjet printer, and yeah, print on, printed on tracing paper, and then you print it in draft mode so that you don't get the full ink. Yeah, I had done that with regular paper before years and years ago, and that was all the rage some years ago. And I'd done it with regular paper, and sanded the back of the paper, and tore more of them, and ripped, and sanded through more of them that I ended up with being complete. The tracing paper, absolutely. I just again, it's it mixed multimedia. There are different mechanisms, different techniques that achieve different types of results. And it entirely depends. If you're trying to recreate um, the metal plaques, the metal knee-high plaques and stuff that were all the rage, all common in Appalachia uh, in my era, then paper is a spectacular medium for recreating that because it stands proud. It's thick like a sheet, of, like a tin side would be. But if you're wanting something that's more like a, you know, that's more painted onto the structure, then, then either de decals, um, or you've got to work in the really, really thin transfer paper either. And it, and it depends on the technique. And I, honestly, I don't think I, if I was doing graffiti, unequivocally, I'm not artistic or creative enough to do that with pens or pencils or something. If I did graffiti on anything, and I'm modeling 1950, so, so you know, somebody's pa or somebody's daddy would have beat them to death if they had spray painted the local building, but... If you model an era where, where graffiti is, is prevalent and you're you are recreating it, I can't imagine doing graffiti any other way than with decals. That's just Yeah, I got a bunch of your decals, Dave. Started out with me winning them on the Saturday show. Well. Hope you like them. I do. It just depends on what you're doing. There's different mediums. They that you just get different results with different mediums. And I just, I mean, with anything I do, everything I do, uh, the key to making it look realistic. I, there's a couple keys. One is I've said before is that humans are dirty, dirty creatures. So everywhere we go, we leave a mess. So if you want it, the, the world you're modeling to look like people, 
actually live in it, then you've got to make it dirty and messy and papers laying everywhere and trash. And it, that's just what it is. It's just what's there in the real world. So and well, you I'm have thinking, you have some of that stuff on your decals, the old newspaper sheets. And right here. Yep. And I'll tell you what, there's no better way that I, that's that's I, I, I will get more of those from you because that is there's no question that's the way to do that. Because I tried to print some myself and forget that I do that. I, I don't know if you see it or not, but on this dumpster right there, there's newspapers laying all around it and everything on the ground. Yep. And stuff and in it. Yeah, trash is the key. Trash, graffiti, and all that stuff. The dirtiness that humans do to everything they touch. That's part of the key. And diversity. Um, so, modeling Appalachia, trees are really important. Like, I've talked about trees a lot. I've kind of talked about trees, so I'm blue in the face about trees. But, um, well, if you're you modeling let, Appalachia, you need to have some cars in the, in the hauler. Oh, oh, yeah. Right, yeah, old, rusted up. Uh, I've got some... Uh, I'm trying to think of who it is. They they look like microengineering boxes. Got yellow, uh, yellow stickers, yellow decals, or a yellow box with with black writing on it. They've got uh, 1930s, 1920s, 1930s Model Ts and stuff like that in a kit form. Uh, I got a few of those, and I forget who makes oh, them. But they're J Jordan Highway Miniatures. Jordan, yeah, they're they're great. I haven't fit, I haven't built any of them, but I've got a couple of those. I got a bulldozer from them. It's like a 1920 style bulldozer. I don't know if you can see that on where my camera's at. Yeah, they had old paddle wagon. That I'm working on. And it's just a... Uh... Oh, gosh, I think this one is a rusty stumps. Rusty rusty nails, maybe? Yeah, the, the and I've got some of the resin ones from... <laughs> Sylvan? Sylvan bottle? Sylvan bottle? Sylvan bottle. Yep, Sylvan. Uh, Canada. Yep. They make the vast, the the highest quantity of vehicles in my era. Nobody really makes a lot in my era. Silver is about the best choice I have uh, for vehicles in my era. So I've got a few of those. I've built one or two of them so far, and uh, they're you know resin car kits. I just got to figure out the window glass part. I, I want to use that uh, Mike Buddy trick of the clear, clear, clear tape. I just have not made that work perfectly yet but yeah rusty up rusted cars and all that in appalachia is key and i've got ho scale uh bottles like knee high or pop or beer bottles little bottles um they're incredibly super tiny 3d printed they, you know they come in a little square about smaller than a postage stamp that have a hundred on it oh gosh so, who's, make, who's making those um it's uh they're a ed tracks is the one who designed them uh, hangs out in our community sub here, and uh, Ed tracks are designed them, and he uh, uh, he's got them on uh, on his site and on his Shapeways page. Uh, he's so, uh, he's he's got he's given them to uh, Rusty Stumps as well. The Rusty, Rusty, Rusty Stumps got them. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's done a bunch of stuff for Rusty. The his th the pretty three D print stuff is spectacular. It's absolutely my favorite uh, transformers for power poles and stuff. and stuff that Ed designed and Shapeways. <laughs> Well, I got a bunch of plumbing fittings. I do too. Yeah, I've made numerous pipe, uh, and I run all the pipe assembly coming out of the river for the pump house, a pump station that goes to those water towers I was talking about, the NBW castings on. And I run all that pipe fitting with the with the valve and all that stuff, and that's all 3D printed stuff that they had designed. It, it looks superb, but the little bottles are great. But diversity is is the key to it. I mean, with trees, the the key to it is 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 different mediums. The trees don't look the same. So I don't care how you good you get with wire trees or sagebrush trees or, or, or sedum or super trees or whatever. Diversity is what makes it believable. Having a, a, a range of different materials there. So so e even on a loud, I don't think, I, I love hydrocount. I love wood structures. And, uh, you know, I would never choose just one medium to work with because I, I think it, it is much more just like the real world and its diversity. If, the layout uses multiple mediums and multiple techniques to get the end result. It's going to feel more diverse, like the real world. Yep. So next show we'll be back in January. We're uh, Johnny's still got to. Uh, we got to work on the schedule for that, so we'll get that posted as soon as we have that uh, for the January show. Uh, uh, likely to, to have Delta Deco uh, uh, available to talk about about these kits uh, as well. Uh, we'll paint and color the my kit 
Ralph probably and Lloyd should have his by then. Talk about some of those techniques. I'll go ahead and put a primer coat on about ahead of that as well. Um, so it can be dry. You do need to put a primer coat to reduce how much the plaster will soak up anything that touches it. So you got to put a primer coat on it. Yep. And if you're if you're interested in on, on how to do it uh, on the Art Deco or the Downtown Deco site, they have a whole uh, tutorial on how to prime your work. And I'm sure, Dave, Dave, you must have a method as well. You must start out with a primer as well, right? I got a four-part four four-part four video series on my YouTube channel on you building hydrocal kits. Um, and I use I start out with a primer. You can also not just prime, but you could you could also you could use uh, just a, a cryolite crystal clear flat. Right. I and that's part of the technique that the New England brownstone guy had wrote up uh, for how to do. Uh, the stonework and to create the kind of speckled uh, color texture or color contour that happens on these, on these uh, square cut stone. Um, and what he does is mist from some distance, uh, a clear polyurethane clear coat. And I, it, it absolutely does create that speckling because when you put, then when you put washes of paint on, it absorbs in just parts of it to most of it. And then it has speckles where it doesn't absorb it's a different and, effect. And if you use an old Thomas York kit, like the Thomas York kits that I just got to build, most from 1979 and most from 1980. Um, and uh, the, he used to pour a lot of those in terracotta. Wow. So so they were actually uh, already, the stone was already covered. So if you if you, if you you seal it with a clear with a clear coat instead of a white paint, and then all you got to do is go in and just do a wash on it. And that, therefore, uh, I think I've, I'll have to show you. I don't have a picture of it. It's already been shipped off. Um, but um, I've got a picture somewhere, but it's not on this computer that I'm on right now. But I could see benefits to using a matte finish as well if you needed texture, uh, if you needed some grip uh, on top of it. It just depends on how you're going to get your final result. If you're going to airbrush it or if you're going to, you know, I'm going to use sponge and multiple colors of red paint because I've got good results with that already. Um, yeah, but if, if you're going to use a wash, it's better to have either a semi or a gloss finish so that the wash will flow into yeah. the crevices. Yeah, otherwise it wants to stick. Yeah, the flat flat finishes are, work great for particulates, uh, for powders or, yeah. or, or pigment. No. Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, that was that was my two choices: tissue paper and tracing paper. Yeah, we're okay. talking about Martin's question. Ralph's uh, talking about Martin's question about uh, if he if we tried printing on uh, on tissue paper, if he tried tissue paper. And yes, well, that's that's the, the the two things that I use: tissue paper, the stuff you wrap gifts for. Or gifts with at Christmas time, and tracing paper, and you get two different two different finishes, depending on how much opaqueness you want in the in the sign, depending on which one you use. And there's different grades of, of tracing or transfer paper. Transfer paper is yeah, tracing paper, but not just, so much just, transfer paper. That's that's yeah. a different paper altogether. But I got different grades of it. So when I, when we first started talking and messing with that, I got I I you I used whatever I found locally. I think at Walmart. But uh, um, see it's since then I picked some up and I haven't haven't messed with it or put any on buildings. But I did go ahead and put some. I printed made some signs, printed some signs. So so I probably use them on this structure with that with a higher end uh, tracing paper that I bought at Hobby Lobby. I think so uh, or Dick Blicks maybe, but. Uh, a good art supply, you're going to be able to find tracing paper in probably three or four different grades. You can also find what uh, what they used to call onion skin, which is even finer than trace pa tracing paper. Um, and when you put it down on the model, it tends to disappear altogether. So it's a if vellum, there's any, right? Yes, but very, very thin. So if you're like in, in the Pepsi sign here, Pepsi has the white in that center band. 
And in order to get that white to show up, you have to, where you cut this out of the paper, you use the opening that you cut out to use as a template to spray white on the building. Yeah, that's worth going back. We did that video. Ralph walked me through doing it that way because he was getting a lot better results than I was getting with paper. That's that's uh, maybe a year ago or so on this on the and it'll be in the playlist in YouTube Model Builders. Yep. Uh, and it'll be the, those wall sides done in paper if you need to produce your own. Um, or, de or decals do the job too. There's just different places for different things. So, all right, guys, we'll call that for this show. That's basic assembly of hydrocal. We'll get to paint and finishes uh, uh, on the January show. We'll have some pr possibly an interview if we can work that the technical details of that out. Um, if we get to it, we may get to try to finish the exterior and talk about roofing and how we're going to solve that problem. But uh, we'll have several more shows of this coming up. And then probably uh, February, we may, we will probably be dealing with exterior details uh, since Miles will be tied up in January dealing with Amherst show. And I definitely want Miles because uh, he's done some, some pretty spectacular stuff. It'd be worth going ahead and checking out Model, uh, Model Railroad University, uh, his YouTube channel for, for the short video that he did on the uh, uh, brass headrail system. Uh, which is what I'm going to be putting on the back side of this structure is a, a, a similar kit. It's a different kit. I'm using a wild hair, uh, H A R E, a kit from wild hair bottles. That's pretty superb, but I'm going to cut it up and use it as a, as a porch that's, system instead of a fire escape. Oh, the fire. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I bought fire escape. I bought, uh, the three piece or whatever that they have add on floors. And I bought a few add on floors, not knowing how I would use it, but I've went and looked at the parts now and I'm pretty sure I could put that together as uh i think i have to buy a piece yeah right as the balcony on the back deck where i was talking about where i'm going to build that wood wall section and in front of that right. will be an etched etched but i think it'll be an etched metal i'm still working on the details of how i'm going to how that's going to work out because i think it'll have to have a wood i think the deck will have to be a wood floor deck but i'm still i'm still thinking about parts of that so uh but We'll get the show schedule posted for January. We'll finish the outside of the uh, construction up then and have an interview. February, we'll be dealing with exteriors and details. Uh, probably the month after that. Uh, in March, we'll be dealing with interiors. I want to talk some, but I want to get started on doing some, some pretty decent interior stuff. Uh, I've got a bunch of 3D printed stuff uh, for uh, uh, a, a, a soda pop stand. You know, it's 1950 here, so... Um, a diner. That's pretty nice parts. Diner. That's the word. That's what I'm looking. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, I've got a stay in with the, you know all the details and a, a nice 3D parted uh, 3D printed part for that. It's pretty spectacular. Um, so I look forward to that. Especially Lloyd's interior work is absolutely superb on his YouTube channel. He's done some uh, uh, posted several videos showing the how much work he's done on, on interiors here lately. Uh, we and him talked about that. Uh, considerably because with the shoe store I, uh, I've got the best way uh, Lloyd and I could figure out how to do this was to buy a bunch of those uh, hundred uh, cheap uh, figures from from China and cut the feet off from uh, cut the feet off from them <laughs> to fill my shoe store up with with shoes but it's a lot of trouble and they're quite small oh but, yeah but it pays off so all right thanks thanks everybody for joining us this month that's going to finish up the fine scale show for, for this year with uh, YouTube model builders have a few more shows this year. Of course, we have the Thursday show coming up. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody that I don't see uh, prior to that. Happy holidays to everyone. So look forward to catching you guys again in January back on this show. We'll finish up the uh, uh, construction assembly, coloring and paint of the, of a hydro cow kit. So right thanks on. everybody for joining us. Have a good night. Right. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, whatever holiday you celebrate. Absolutely. Merry Christmas. All righty. Uh, tomorrow night we've got uh, Joe's train room. That'll be at 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern time. And then Thursday night we got Johnny Small train talk, which will be uh, 9 o'clock Central, 10 o'clock Eastern time. So, uh, and then we've only got uh, one more show right after uh, Christmas on the 28th. No, 
27th, excuse me, 27th, will be another Johnny Small Train Talk. And that'll be the last one for the year of 2018. So we'll see y'all tomorrow night for uh, Joe's Train Room. Y'all have a good evening.